we are not quite at one o'clock, but welcome. Welcome um, people of the World Wide Web and um, Te Tai Tokoro to the Regulatory and Compliance Committee meeting. Um, we are live streaming, so I just need to remind all attendees to um, turn your microphones off if you are not speaking and if you would like to um, express an opinion or ask a question at, um, on an item on a report on the agenda, sorry, um, raise your hand or I will try and keep my wits about and watch for movement on the screen um, or pop it in the chat. Feel free to pop it in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to open with a karakia now. Um, here we go. Bakataka te hau ki te uru, bakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai. E he akiana o te atakura, he teo, he huka, he hauhu, tihe mauri ora. Mauri ora. Kia ora. And I'd just like to invite um, Dr. Dean Myberg, our um, General Manager for this department, to um, just give us a little update on um, everything in his world. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Madam you, Chair. Um, in particular, you asked me to talk to the committee about our arrangements under Alert Level 2 and Alert Level 3 as we find ourselves um, in at the moment. So the essential differences between Alert Level 2 and 3 are that our Outward facing services, our customer facing, facing services, customer service centres, libraries, eyesights, etc., are closed. Um, we have some staff in the field currently. Um, building inspections um, continue to happen, but there are very specific protocols around that. When visiting the sites, our building officers uh, do check with the site concerned and the builders on site that they are following certain protocols and then maintaining the, the necessary social distancing and so on. Um, some of our libraries have staff, just two staff um, in, in libraries doing behind the scenes work, catch up work in terms of uh, stocking books, et cetera, they, it, just uh, looking at the collections and getting things ready for alert level two. Alert Level 2 has a lot more freedoms uh, in terms of staff being physically present, following the protocols, of course, wearing masks where they have contact with the public. Um, so mask wearing is important. We, in our office environments, uh, under Alert Level 2 and 3, we have some staff working out of offices, but not customer facing. Um, they are following the protocols and we've gone to extreme lengths to emphasize the need for caution, um, mask wearing, social distancing, uh, all of the protocols, hand washing, etc. So um, we are mindful of the fact that outbreaks in the far north, um, as we have at the moment, uh, or the potential for outbreaks uh, are pretty serious and that they would put us in a in a rather difficult position in terms of um, continuity of, of business. It's something we've also practiced as a group. We've, we've done business continuity planning, um, and we recently uh, exercised, at the beginning of August, we exercised um, around flooding happening at the same time as an outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, which does obviously challenge our staff and would challenge our staff in a real scenario. Uh, but we believe we're well prepared with plans. Um, there's been we've been there before, not flood so much, but uh, the pandemic alert levels and the planning for that. We, it's well documented now, so we find that we can switch quite. And this applies to the to the organisation at large because uh, I'm heading up a small team of. Crisis, it's called the crisis response team, a small team of people who are focused on welfare, logistics, etc. So we've got that well covered, um, and we and with Richard Edmondson and his um, communications team, we put out regular um, communications updates um, to staff um, and through the chief executive's office. We we keep 
um, everyone informed as to what we are doing and what the alert levels mean for them. I'm happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. That's just a very brief, a brief overview of what we're doing through alert levels and switching from one alert level to the next, um, keeping a close eye on government. Um, uh, government announcements and then also looking to work with colleagues uh, across the district, uh, colleagues in other agencies I should say, um, because I think there's a, a need for some joined up, um, uh, you know, uh, planning around that. But uh, Sean Clark, our Chief Executive, may want to comment. He is a regular member of the Northland Intersectoral Forum. I have stood in for him on one or two occasions. There is some coordinated planning and thinking going on at that level. Thanks, Dean. Look, most Absolutely. of it's. Beg your pardon, um, Madam Chair, at your, at go your ahead, discretion. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Look, I, um, I, 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 I've said this many times before, but I, I say it again. This council's got its pants on for this in great style. It's. Um, got resilience, business continuity, other organisations don't routinely have. That's hard earned by the team and, and the proceeds are well deserved now because we've got spare capacity, uh, which we, which may or may not be called on. Uh, the SLT met on Sunday, I was on leave. I just think that speaks to the ethos of leadership in the, in the council, that they would pull themselves together to make sure they got all the bases covered. Um, so that's com that's commendable. I know elected members, uh, and I just recognise a couple that have been mentioned to me recently, including um, Moko Tipania and Kelly Stratford, who have been quite, shall we say, expeditionary in COVID comms, with very targeted outreach to people that need to understand vaccination. Uh, the forum that I join uh, North regularly every second day at the moment, Northland is intersectoral forum, which brings the different agencies together. Is quite a big deal, but um, there's one big weakness that's becoming apparent about now, <clears throat> and that is that um, we've all just got our heads, I think, just getting our heads around the idea that the strategy's changed for New Zealand, that uh, Delta Free New Zealand is never going to happen, and strangely could never have happened. We're just waking up to the idea that for the rest of the world to visit our tourism or our business and to give us the disease and for us to shut the whole economy down every time someone sneezes was never actually tenable. But there's this wonderful new strategy that makes complete sense, and that is lockdowns continue until New Zealand reaches a certain percentage of vaccination and then uh, no holds barred, we're back to normal. And we'll just live with people going to hospital at the rate of two beds a night in Northland uh, when we get to 90 or 95 per cent. So what hasn't happened is the district is not coordinated around the race to freedom. The district's not coordinated around the race to freedom, whatever that is, whether it's 90 or 95 per cent. All the different agencies and all the different councillors are all just doing their own very wise individual things to reach pockets and to have a conversation with the vaccine hesitant and the vaccine lazy. And we are missing the synergy of what a great joined up campaign would look like. Uh, we use the Natehini vans and the radio broadcast and the mural um, TV3 interview and uh, and you stitch it together and spot the, the emissions and the duplications and do a better job. We are not organised. We're bimbling along to great effect and that may be the best we can do, but there's a prospect out there for anyone who wants to stand up and lead that a more organised race to freedom could be coined and and pursued. I'll just plant that on the table with the leaders of the district and pass back to the chair. Thank you very much for that, Sean. Um, the mayor would just like to give us an update as well in this um, pre-meeting section. Th thank you, Kelly, and hi, everybody. Um, I've just done a TV3 interview for tonight, uh, if it runs, and it's just so everybody's updated on the information that I've been given now is that the two ladies are both uh, both have COVID. They both attended a um, funeral of someone who lived and died in Kawakawa. The f funeral was in Pai here. 
and um, so they're both, both now down in, in Auckland again. But um, I've just said that we're in what we love them to, to tell us everybody where they went and all that sort of stuff. And also just so that our community um, uh, can go and get tested and get vaccinated. And Kelly, I also said on the interview that you were doing your best to encourage people down there to do so. So, um, and all of us, as best as we can, as Sean has said, the more we can get vaccinated and more testing we do, the, the better we're going to end up coming out of this. But the worry is now that these both these ladies are infected and they're very likely have been associated with people at the funeral. It's very likely that it could well be um, transmitting across our community and we need to get tested and we need to get vaccinated. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for that, Your Worship. Um, and I, I did have a test. I've had two in the last week and mine are all negative, thank goodness. Because, um, yes, I have been out and about and um, Kawakawa is my main, main place. Right, um, let's crack on into our agenda now. Uh, we don't have any apologies or declarations of interest for this meeting and there's no deputations. Uh, let's move to 4.1, the confirmation of previous minutes. And if there are no issues with this, may I please have a mover and a seconder for these minutes? Maybe the move will be also the move, Dave Collard. Oh, thank you. Usich and Collard. Rachel, I think they just be you. Their voices were louder, maybe. Um, any discussion on these minutes, please? All those in favour? And so please don't say aye. We have to go through one by one. Yep, I'm four. Collard. I'm four. Dave Collard, four. Carter. And apologies, I don't, is Councillor Clendon in our meeting today? I it believe he like might be at next. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, well, I don't know whether I've had apologies, so we didn't move any, sorry. Um, next again. Deputy Mayor, <laughs> Deputy Mayor Anne Court. In favour. Councillor Smith. Support. Councillor Vucic. Yes, support. Member Ward. Yes, in favour. Thank you. And um, Mayor Carter, we couldn't hear you say I, but I'm pretty sure you did. Yes, I. <laughs> All right, so moving on to information report 5.1, noise control and parking enforcement update. Rochelle, you are the author of this report and you will possibly present to us on that, but can I please firstly have a mover that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report noise control and parking enforcement update. Yeah, I'll so move. Dave Collard. Thank you, Councillor Collard, and the seconder. I'll second. John Thank Carter. you. Awesome. And Rochelle, did you have a presentation on this here report to start? I do, Madam Chair. Um, I will try Excellent. and so, um, share my screen with you. Perfect. Um, and if members know. have questions, could you save them till the end of the um, presentation? Thank you. Wow, that's an image. <laughs> so my, just double checking that you can see my screen? Yes. Oh, great, okay. And you can't see the comments? <laughs> it's just the pictures? Uh, we can see the numbers to the oh. right of the photo. No, no, no we, can't see, we can't see the notes. <laughs> no, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, 
I take it that the report has been um, read by everybody. So I've just got a bit of a summary here in the presentation. Um, one thing that I would like to note first off, um, there is a bit of a difference that I've, um, with, there was a, a bit of an error with the data um, and having gone through it again, uh, there is a, um, with the action taken, there are a few changes to the numbers that were in the report. Um, mostly that's one extra seizure uh, was performed, uh, raising up to eight. Um, and there are now 89 excessive noise directives um, that were issued and it uh, was in the report of 76. And 167 verbal warnings were given and it was reported that was 144. So I do apologise for the, the change in numbers. Um, there was still 784 noise complaints. Um, and 90% of those complaints were in urban areas. Um, and in those urban areas, 78% um, was uh, within the hour response time was met. Uh, rural has a, a response time of two hours and that was um, at 86%. If I can move the slides, it's not working. So um, of the action taken, I've just done a bit of a snapshot um, of where they were um, located um, and I've tried to do them within the wards. Uh, so as you can sort of see, there are um, Kaitaia, um, Kerikeri and Kaikoi are the um, most common areas where there have been ENS notices issued and seizures. Uh, so the noise contract with First Security is um, still under an extension and it's um, on a, the contract still under extension, sorry. Uh, we are looking at separating that out from the other First Security um, roles such as uh, buildings and uh, uh, alarm responses and everything like that. Um, and we see that there are some potential uh, benefits in having a separate noise contract where we can really clearly define response areas, potentially putting in coastal um, zones which require um, further uh, travel, uh, distance travelled and things like that, longer time to get there. Um, and also putting some um, strong KPIs um, in, in things like that. So there are a few issues in regards to response times at the moment that we're working through. Um, and a lot of those, as the report said, um, does come down to travel and also in relation to being able to get um, police resourcing to attend to some of these um, RFS. So going on to um, parking enforcement, uh, there were 431 parking infringements issued between January and August um, and most of those are over the time limit or in reserved disabled car parks. Um, Kirikiri and Paihia have the highest number of infringements issued. And I've just done a bit of a snapshot. So this was um, in the first two and a half weeks of August before we went into lockdown. Um, and that was... Um, the infringements that were issued uh, per, in, in the suburbs. Um, during those 12 working days, the wardens had spent, <coughs> excuse me, three days um, in Kaitaia, three days in Kaikohi, uh, four days in Kirikiri, and one and a half days was spent in Paihia. Uh, the higher numbers in Kirikiri and Paihia are reflective of uh, Kaikohi having the state highway, uh, so we don't have state highway delegation at the moment and the side roads of Kaikoi really aren't of, of major concern for us. Um, and Kaitai has a lot more free parking areas uh, for people that perhaps work in the, the urban areas more so. So the old pack and save uh, car park, the old warehouse car park there that you do find a lot of people use that for sort of um, longer parking. Um, so the vehicle inspection trial for uh, WAFs and REG, those are, it has been underway since 1st of July. Um, and this is a, the graph of where we've actually noted the unwarranted and unlicensed vehicles. 
Um, we did increase the flyers, so the flyers started going out onto vehicles in July, um, and we did have have quite a good response from the flyers, so we increased that to run uh, through July and August. Um, obviously, uh, with COVID then being locked down, the uh, parking warden didn't get back onto the road until 8th of September, and of course he's off again now uh, up until level two. Um, but during this period, you can see that Kaikoi and Kaitaia have got the highest number of unwarranted and unlicensed, um, but unlicensed is, is definitely a lot more common than unwarranted vehicles. Um, so that's um, sort of where we're sort of working at at the moment. There haven't been any infringements issued so far. Um, NZTA have extended the uh, period of time where vehicles um, without warrants uh, have until the 30th of November at this stage, and we're expecting that now to increase again. Uh, so once we do go back out, we'd be looking at uh, working with vehicles that have an unwarranted um, extending longer than six months. And that's the end of the presentation. I'll Thank you for that, that, Rochelle. I um, wonder if anybody has a question. Yes, Councillor Collard, you have the floor. So, thank Screen. you, Kelly. A uh, couple of questions. Um, one of them, Kai Tire excessive noise complaints. Were these all resolved or well, were they uh, comebacks to get that high number or have we just got constant parties going on in Kai Tire? Uh, through the chair, um, going through the raw data, there are certainly um, addresses that um, come up more so than others. Um, if I go back to, um, there was 26 ends notices issued, but only one seizure, uh, which which does um, sort of give an indication that um, the noise was excessive enough to issue uh, a, a noise direction. Um, those noise directions do last for 72 hours. Um, and a seizure would only have occurred if uh, there, there were noise complaints that were excessive again within those 72 hours. So um, it would seem that by issuing the ENDS notices there, um, it has been effective. Um, and of course, there was a lot of verbal warnings within that as well. Um, but yes, there were definitely um, common addresses in that raw data. Okay, uh, the second question was um, with the, um, uh, the the graph there of unlicensed or, and or unwarranted vehicles, and it said an average percentage, an average of what is that, a daily average or a visit average or what was that average? Uh, so that average, so that was um, running from the 30th of June to the 16th of August, and so that was an average of the vehicles seen during that period of time. When we first started putting the flyers up, um, we did uh, note a higher number of unwarranted and unregistered vehicles, and over the, the months it was slowly reducing, which is the reason why, especially within the first month, that we decided to give more of a an educational approach to the trial. So that was the average over that from 30 Ju 1 July to the 16th of August. Thank you. Great questions, Councillor Collard. Um, apparently the hands should appear in the order, in an order. So at the top of the screen, I've got um, Councillor Court. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> It's too slow. I ran over to grab my phone because I wanted to take a picture of that one with the little red car parked over two car parking spots because I know that person. Not that car, but I know that <laughs> And um, if he's watching, he knows I'm talking about him right now. Uh, and he parks actually over four spots. He parks right in the middle. And he maintains he does that to protect his car because the car parking spots are too small in, uh, in our car parks. And every time he parks in town, he ends up with dents and scratches in his car uh, from the cars that park alongside him. And I'm actually quite sympathetic to that 
Um, and anybody who knows me knows that I'll park in the furthest car park away from humanity uh, to avoid that. But we are like lemmings and inevitably when I come out to come back to my car, there's one on either side. And it is sometimes, we've all experienced, really hard to get back in your car because you've only got about that much room to open your door. Uh, that led to a debate with my mate. Uh, and I, as long as your wheels are inside the line, you're okay. Your car can overhang the line, but your wheels must be inside the line. Um, he didn't know that. So that leads me to two questions. My long way around. Um, are we doing enough to educate the public, do we think, on how they should park their cars? Um, the second one is, in our engineering standards and guidelines, developers will get away with the least possible space they possibly can. We know that. Maximise the number of car parks chew up the least amount of available space but it is really tight and it is something that we should might want to turn our mind to about whether we make those car parks a little bit bigger There's, it's not just the damage to your car it's also the practicalities we have limited disability car parks in our district and our district is getting older and it's extremely challenging for some of our elderly and some of our less mobile to get in and out of their cars when they've only got a space of about, and it is only about that much to open their door and get in and out because of the tightness of the car parks. So perhaps we want to be having a conversation about more disabled car parks or wider disabled car parks or just wider car parks in general. But Rochelle, if you could send me that picture, I am so committed to my friend. And I'm going to say, look, you made the council agenda today. Could, could I comment on that, please, uh, Kelly? Yes, uh, yep, sure. Yeah, look, I, I'll go back to when I built Muscle Rock in 2000 and I was dealing with, with council in terms of a number of car parks for my licence. Now, council did not appear to be too concerned about the size of the car parks so the required number, I just painted them in. There is no way you can fit cars in those car parks, even today. And if you look at, and I've been I've been out of Muscle Rock for eight or nine years now, but if you look at all licensed premises, they go for the exact minimum that they possibly can in terms of car parks, because there's car parks for Africa, especially in Kotai. Um, just, it's, it's something that happens. I, I just painted in car parks because that's how many I had to have and it was acceptable. Just comment. Thank you for that, Councillor Collard. Um, Rochelle, did you have anything to say in response to those questions or comments? It's okay if you don't. Um, it's probably Madam, more, um... <laughs> Madam Chair, I understand that there are um, set car parking sign sizes and that they are often within a, a resource consent um, but if those are missing um, and it's just to allocate car parks and you know uh, one or two disabled then that potentially can um, cause uh, different sizes so I think it's it's good to be mindful of ensuring you know that car park sizes need to be incorporated in, in such things as resource consents. Thank you for that. And um, I have sent you my screenshot that I grabbed. Uh, well, it's to everyone, it's in the chat if that's helpful. I thought that was a very great picture. Now, I found where the raised hand feature shows me who was next. And I'm sorry if I had done it out of order before. I've got Member Ward next, and then you, Council of Usage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a few questions. First one um, around uh, the Waka Kotahi um, on the state highways being able to enforce parking. Do we have a time frame around that when we're likely to hear back? Um, that's my first question. <laughs> Madam Chair, um, so I have sent through the delegation um, 
application through to NZTA um, and I don't have a set time frame but I'm hopeful to have um, that through in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Um, just on relation to Anne's comments about the size of car parks, um, I've had experience um, in town with a number of issues um, on properties whereby, particularly if it's if it's parking required under resource consent, whereby they have to be shown on the plan the number of required parks for the development or activity, but they act, there's actually nothing in the consent to say they must be physically painted on the ground. So perhaps that's something we could pick up on. And um, it's, it's, I know it sounds like a bit of a joke, but uh, when you come up against it and there's just a blank area and there's actually no lines painted there and, it's, and people can just park anywhere, that's a, a problem within itself. So that's something perhaps we could look at through um, resource consent or planning side of things. My next question was in relation to um, noise. I know I've asked this question before whether we or the contractors actually have anything to measure the level of sound or the decibels uh, because on page 20 of the report it's a bit of a he, she, he said she said um, so the, the noise control officer will actually just determine uh, if the noise is reasonable or within permissible levels. So if this is not being measured how can it actually be um, and enforced and prosecuted upon, I guess, is my query. And the second part to that is on the graph on page 22, we actually um, have a target of 95%. Now, for a council that's striving for excellence, I can't get my head around that, I'm sorry. It should, it should be 100%. It shows it's achievable. It was achieved in February and almost achieved in July and August. So... Um, <laughs> I don't know, I just want to know why are we, are we discounting the contract because they only have to meet 95%? Do we expect under 100% in other contracts? I think, you know, everything should be, our target should be 100% to, you know, within the best of their ability to, to strive to achieve that 100% target. So um, those were my, oh no, sorry, I had one more question. Um, do you want to answer that first? Is it easier? <laughs> Sorry, Rochelle, I might bombard um, you. The, the noise. Chair. So um, with, with residential noise, there is um, no requirement for um, any monitors to measure the noise. It is up to the uh, noise officer to determine whether or not it is um, excessive. Um, and that's, that's across nationally. So um, that is, uh, what legislation allows. Um, your second question was around the contract. Excellence. The mm -hmm. excellence. Um, yes, yeah, so acknowledge that there is um, a bit of work to do here, which is one of the reasons why we do want to separate the, the contract out um, to have a separate um, noise control um, contract. Um, a couple of the... Um, reasons why we're not meeting um, requirements in recent discussions is that um, it there are, there are some um, the contract well the contract at, at this time doesn't have um, the travel times are not based from the locations where first security are based at which is um, Kitty Kitty and Kaitaia and so when you do have a, a rural property um, it can sometimes be two hours to, to actually travel to those areas. And so I think, you know, in a, a, a new contract, it would be capturing coastal areas and everything like that. Um, so you would sort of have a target um, with levels of where those exact um, urban and rural are. And the current contract, having been so old, um, doesn't uh, capture... Um, those those areas very well and it's really determined um, sort of by the administration side on which urban is, and which is rural. Um, the other, uh, another reason where uh, that, that target is slipping is a lot of the properties that we do get uh, recidivist offenders are ones that are red flagged where it's not safe for the security officers to attend without the police. And so police resourcing is, um, although there's a great relationship between first security and the police, um, 
as you're aware that you know other um, incidents come up where police resourcing is required and so noise gets put back to be something that is not an, as urgent as perhaps a domestic dispute or, or violence and things like that. So um, a lot of the times they are reliant on police to go back to that property or to go on to that property. And so they, although they may get there, um, they can't respond fully because they can't go onto the property without police assistance. So that's something that we continue to work work through as well. Um, Thank you, Rochelle. Dean just has something he would like to say, perhaps in addition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just, just on that, in terms of threatening behaviour towards staff um, and or contractors, we have had uh, examples of um, contractors following up on noise complaints and then only to be um, staring down the barrel of a, a rifle in the dark um, when, when the door is opened. Uh, we have, just as a matter of interest for the committee, just in recent statistics, it shows that 46% of our health and safety incidents ac across the last year uh, have been threatening behaviour incidents. So uh, whether they be parking wardens or our contractors dealing with noise complaints, this is alive and well in the far north. We have that situation and our staff and also the health and safety of our contractors uh, that is a top priority. So we are giving attention to um, a method of recording the so-called red flag addresses with caution that when our staff or contractors approach uh, or go to those addresses that they should be extra careful. And sometimes that means having two staff uh, attend, um, two up, one in support and also focusing on the health and safety, obviously, of, of our staff. So I just mentioned that because that is a factor too, um, and it's something that we are applying our minds to in terms of ensuring health and safety at all times. Thanks for that, Dean. Rochelle, I think Thank you had further. No? Finished with the My Linda's? final question, oh, thanks yes. Kelly, page 24. Um, in relation to the high um, offending and disability parts, I have asked before that consideration, in fact the Community Board has asked that consideration be given um, to adding the cost of the fine, uh, which I think is from memory is about $150 as, as a deterrent to the sign. Has anything happened in regard to that? Is, can we legally do that? Uh, to actually add a sign to our uh, disabled parking signs as a huge deterrent. Um, I'm just wondering whether that's actually been actioned or whether that resolution was picked up um, from the community board um, by the committee. Um, through the chair, um, I agree that it would be a good idea. Uh, we currently don't have budget for sign at the moment, but that's certainly something that we can pick up with um, our counterparts in um, infrastructure um, with the NTA and, and see whether or not we can actually get some additional signs put up uh, with those disabled car parks. Um, I think it would be a good deterrent. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank Dean. you. That was all my questions. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks for that, Member Ward. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to add to what Rochelle was saying there, it's working with our colleagues in the infrastructure group, but also with Richard Edmondson and his team. Uh, there is a focus on signage across the district at large uh, to look at how we can, in a more cost effective way and a more efficient way, um, focus on a rebranding or a re, um, reissuing of signage um, to be more effective. So yes, disabled car parks, but there's also the issue of parking, uh, of signage um, across the district on beaches in different locations to uh, bring home the idea of what people may do as opposed to what the deterrence might be. Uh, so it does require careful consideration and the intent is to roll that out and budget permitting working collaboratively across the, the council to uh, bring that kind of solutioning to our signage at a district wide level. Awesome, thank you. Now, um, Councillor Vujicic, can you remember what your question was? Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Stratford. Yep, yeah, uh, I, I can. 
the uh, it's on page 25 and it's to do with parking and 26 and there are two graphs there one shows that there are zero um, parking infringements one of the concerns that the community board had in the community was that um, disability parking was being used inappropriately now um, and I see zero now I understand what's being said that there's little opportunity to infringe in Kaiko parking, but disability parking is one of them. And then I see that the Kaiko and Kaito Kirikiri Pai here stats. So the parking inspectors are coming over there, and that was one of the concerns also, because we couldn't get them when asked to come over. And we, uh, I think the, it was concluded that they would come over because of the unwarranted unlicensed vehicles and it appears that's the case so is that true they're coming on coming over primarily just to inspect vehicles in Kaikoe because we have zero uh, parking in Brentford so there's two questions there really uh, sorry uh, through the chair so uh, for the second question um, Kaikohi has um, been in in the last uh, couple of months, certainly an area that we're going into to put the flyers around for unregistered and unwarranted vehicles. Um, uh, when we have state highway delegation, uh, there will be um, more of a, a ability to sort of do infringements in regards to um, the restrictions in the, in the main street. We don't um, have very many um, restrictions in the side streets or um, problem uh, areas within those side streets um, and that's the reason why there is no infringements having been issued in those those areas. Um, there's not uh, there's a number of shops that aren't open in the main street in Kaikohi so there really isn't a lot of um, long-term sort of parking in, in a lot of the areas that we are um, picking up. So we have started uh, more of a um, presence in Kaikohi uh, with the the trial um, and then once we have delegation it will be um, on the regular beat. Um, forgive me, I've, I've forgotten the first part of your question. Yeah, the first part of the question, if I can just finish that off, that Waka Kotahi um, has, can set the time limits where the parking is with it and all of those things and certainly we don't have delegation for that but I think if you check under the act there's nothing preventing us from policing that so that's where there is the main concern on the Pine Street where there is uh, disability parking I don't can't remember the time limits myself I don't know if there are any there uh, certainly there's not many opportunities but in the disability parking in, on the main street is one that should be policed Thank you for that, Councillor Vesich. Just to um, reiterate the work stream for state highways, there has been um, a discrepancy with the um, contractors in force. So the, the delegation is being tidied up between Waka Kutahi and FNDC, but there's also um, the issue around um, the em enforcement that needs to be tidied up. And I have had a conversation with Mike Edmonds. He has sent through lots of emails to myself and staff around this matter. And there, we've got a, um, we've got staff have got to a place of understanding with our committee on what the work stream is to tidy this up. And I think that we should just leave it at that. And uh, what was the um, update, Rochelle? We should see in a couple of weeks, another update and um, state highway enforcement to tidy up, especially for disability car parking, because there isn't actually many that we can enforce on the side streets in Kaikwe. Um, many of like the disability car park in the countdown and warehouse car park, that's not ours. We can't enforce it. So we need the um, state highway delegation tidied up um, quick, smart. Sorry, I was talking really fast because Councillor Smith has been waiting for such a long time. Thank you, Madam Chair, and apologies in advance. My connectivity is less than ideal today. Um, so I just had two questions. Thank you, Rochelle, for this report. 
Uh, that's always a really good report. My first one is around noise control. Um, it's great to see the increase in service level for the rural responses, but obviously we're still not seeing it for the urban so much. Um, so my question is, uh, you noted in your presentation that the service delivery report was ongoing uh, as part of reviewing that contract. Um, so I was just wondering when that was going to be completed so we can look at making sure that contract is more fit for purpose and increasing that service level delivery. So that's my first question. And then my second question, I'm not sure if it's a question for Dean or for you or for Darren, but um, given that we're looking for the delegation for State Highways to be coming through in a couple of weeks and we're currently in the parking bylaw review process at the moment, I'm just looking for some understanding of how we might be able to tie that together. And I know we've touched on it before, but now that we've got a better understanding of time, it would be good to just get an idea of that too. Those are my two questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, so uh, for the first part of uh, the first question with the ser uh, service delivery and, and looking at the contract renewal, uh, this needs to go through a um, full review uh, to separate the contract out um, and currently looking um, at money that hasn't been budgeted for in this financial year uh, for that contract to be, doing, uh, to be done. Um, I have started to work through the budgets for um, next year um, and putting aside money for that contract review uh, to be done in the next financial year. Um, it's expected to be about thirty dollars to $40,000 to do the full review and then they get the contract drawn up. Um, so it's, um, yeah, if, if we can sort of squeeze the budget um, in this financial year, we would like to do it earlier. Thanks, Rochelle. And Dean has something he'd like to. Yes, Madam Chair, just here. to add to what Rochelle has just um, mentioned, um, that review obviously needs to coincide with the contract, the bundled contract as we have it at the, at the moment. So we'll work with infrastructure asset management with Andy and his team to review and ensure that our review coincides with with their timing of, of review of the bundled contract. And then secondly, the um, the issue around uh, bylaw and alignment with bylaw reviews, um, we certainly will, one, obtain the, the delegations from, from NZTA and see what that permits us to do in the interim, but with one eye on the future in terms of alignment with bylaw uh, reviews and any changes that we might see come through there. So the intent would be to do both, uh, but obviously the bylaw uh, review will take a bit longer. So we'll work in with that timeline uh, and do what we can within the current uh, permitted arrangements uh, with delegations, uh, any delegations received from NZTA. Thank you, Dean. And Madam Chair, just if I may respond to the um, the response around service delivery reviews. Thank you for uh, outlining that, Rochelle. Um, perhaps I'd just like to take the opportunity to make the comment, I think, to our CEO that this isn't the first time that we've been caught up with not being able to complete service delivery reviews as part of our contracts as an organisation. And I'd like to signal that it would be great to have the conversation to ensure that we are making that part of business as usual going forward to look to continuously review our service delivery and ensure that we're meeting uh, that. Uh, so to be able to budget for that as part of contracts, I think would be a really wise move to make sure that um, the people of the far north are getting the very best service delivery from their money well spent. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for Co that. Copy that. Thank um, you. The um, only additional comment or question I have around um, this report is in relation to um, the inability to respond to noise complaints that may be to a location that is, you know, dangerous or threatening. Um, are they recorded in here as, um, like, are they in here anywhere, ones that we can't attend? Madam Chair, I haven't recorded those in the report. Okay, all right. Um, 
are there any within the last there are aren't there <laughs> i think there was some a week ago <laughs> um yeah it would be perhaps good to know how how many there are and uh you know what what's being done to address them and just you know for everybody's um until some of these the police feel they can't even attend so that's you know that's not good um so can we have the voting up I'm for. I'm for. Dave Collard for. Thank you. In favour. Thank you. In favour. Thank you. In favour. Smith. Thanks. Council of Usage. Aye. Member Ward. Yes, for. Thank you very much, everybody. Now we are on to. Item 5.2 Environmental Health Services Food Licensing Update. The recommendation is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report Environmental Health Services Food Licensing Update. Can I please have a mover? Happy to move. Councillor Smith and Councillor Court. Thank you. And Rochelle, did you have um, a presentation, members? If you have questions, please wait until Rochelle has spoken. Thank you. I do, Madam Chair. I'll just share my Thank screen. You. Awesome. Yep, we oh we were able to. Yep, we can see oh, that. Great, excellent. Um, so I take the report as being read. Uh, the report was an update um, on the food licensing activities across the district between 1st of April and 31st of August. Um, it's just important to note as well that that it was um, written prior to the the latest lockdown. Um, so to date, we do have um, 476 food premises registered in the district, and this is 12 more um, than in the 2021 um, period. Um, so the higher numbers, oops, let me see, I'll just see if I can, um, the highest um, food control plans are in the Bay of Island, Whangaroa, area and the lowest are in the Kaikoui and Hokianga. So in writing this report, there didn't seem to be an impact on any businesses closing down um, due to um, COVID restrictions. However, we appreciate that the latest um, lockdown may have some impact in um, having those struggling. Uh, so all food premise operators are required to renew their registration um, depending on the type of registration that they've got. <clears throat> so it's an incentive for an operator that's compliant um, so they can increase their frequency periods between verifications. Uh, so between 1st of April and 31 of August, there had been 30, 131 verifications completed. Uh, for the complaints um, in this period, there have been 17 um, made to the team. All but one has had a positive outcome uh, with working with um, the operators. Uh, apart from one, uh, where the operator, which you'll see an unregistered operator, has, has eight against uh, their name, um, they were unwilling to comply. So um, an infringement was required to, oops, sorry, um, be issued in, in that case. Uh, in January, um, in my last report that I came to council, um, I reported on the IANS um, assessment. 
and in this um, in that assessment, we continued to meet the requirements of the uh, recognised food agency. And there were three minor non-conformance identified in those action plans, and they have all now been developed and accepted um, to address those, and they'll be closed out by MPI at the next audit, uh, which is scheduled for January next year. Uh, the annual report um, internally confirmed that uh, the Food Verification Authority has a robust auditing program and systems in place and designed to uh, support our objective. The impact of COVID, um, there hasn't been any um, change to the number of registrations held within the Far North District. There's a slight increase in numbers. Um, On-site verifications aren't to occur until level one. Uh, remote checks were encouraged. Initial verifications and routine verifications with, non with a non-compliant history were able to occur if necessary in level two, and we had scheduled those um, to start this week. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Um, there has been an extension for verifications at this time, um, and they've allowed the Food Verification Authority six months to complete the overdue verifications. So to date, we are looking at about 144 overdue verifications for the team to do. Uh, mobile shops, uh, street stalls and alfresco dining. Um, in the five month period that we're reporting on, there have been six mobile shop approvals, 14 street stall approvals and seven alfresco dining approvals. Um, I was also just going to do a quick um, mention around Tikiti Haumaru Kai uh, that was um, launched at a pōwhiri at Te Rito Marae on the 26th of May um, by the Minister of um, Food Safety. Uh, the kiti was developed in partnership between um, local Napui Hapu and the um, Cycle Trust and New, Z New Zealand Food Safety and Northland Inc. So our involvement in that uh, launch was um, attending a number of hui, um, and talking around food questions and having some input into the kiti. So MPI are running the pilot um, and they're running it uh, with six marae um, along the Northland um, cycle trail. And it's so that these marae can provide and sell safe kai to any visitors that are coming through um, to the marae. Um, they can also do overnight stays and everything like that. So the kiti that was um, presented to uh, the individual marais um, had uh, things like guidance on what they needed to do. There were stickers, magnets, thermometers and videos on how they can um, uh, work through the program. Um, so we haven't had any um, involvement in having to do any verifications because this is a pilot and they would be registered directly with the MPI. So, um, at the end of the six-month trial, um, the kiti will be assessed by MPI, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, and any changes will be made if necessary. So, the final slide is just a, a picture of at Te Rito Marae at the launch. Thank you for that, Rochelle. That's great. Um, for the uh, committee members. Um, knowledge, I did ask um, what was happening in the space for Māori, um, knowing that, you know, there are some marae that, you know, do very significant public events. So, um, Rochelle has supplemented this report with that information. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Uh, do members have any questions, please? I've got Dave Collard. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. Uh, three questions. Of the total complaints uh, received, how many were for the same business? Um, Madam Chair, sorry, I do not have um, that information, um, Councillor Collard, but I um, can locate that for you. Okay, let's move on. Um, where there are remote checks, is, are there lesser fees for the recipients of those remote checks, obviously there isn't the the time involvement or the travel um, in terms of uh, going to those businesses to do the physical checks. Are there reductions in fees for that? 
Madam Chair, uh, there isn't any reduction in fees for those remote checks. Um, there is strict criteria for anyone that does need uh, that that does meet the ability to have remote checks. Um, and there are very few that we are able to do due to having technology within the um, actual premises. And as mentioned, there are um, less, um, uh, there are a number of premises owners where English isn't their first language. And so it does um, prove to have some difficulties. So. Um, it, it is a significant time that is having to be spent doing remote checks as well. So although there isn't travel time, um, it's it's a long process to actually get these remote checks around because you're carrying technology to certain freezes and showing and, and working together and everything like that. So the time spent is certainly not really reduced. OK, fair enough. Uh, third question. Uh, and, and this is, is something that's probably a, ho a hobby horse of mine. Why do we have so few alfresco dining facilities in an area where we're supposedly got as much sun as anybody? We have tourists when when it is not COVID time. Um, you know, there's only two in Tahiku by the look of that, or three, is it? Anyway, it's two in Tahiku and five in the Bay of Islands. We uh, um, Al fresco dining is, is is a unique feature that would certainly enhance the atmosphere, the just just the the businesses in turn. Is it a a, a reflection of fees or or what is it? Do we know, uh, Madam Chair? So the the numbers um, were of the applications that were issued within that um, period of time. Um, not the total. There has been, um, there is needing to be a, a lot of work done in this area to capture all the alfresco dining and we're certainly conscious, especially, um, you know, with the alert levels recently where um, food businesses have been quite impacted and so, you know, alfresco dining, um, being able to serve people outside um, is, an, an, is enabling the businesses to actually have more people. So um, there is some work to do around alfresco dining to make sure that the application are received and that it's not impeding on um, footpaths or anything like that and so it's captured actually also in their plan. Um, so there, it, it was um, scheduled to, to happen uh, at the start of this month um, but it, it hasn't, um, was foot patrols in, in certain areas where um, all businesses were to be captured and so hopefully within the next six months we'll have a clearer indication of um, the number of alfresco dining um, places that we do have in the district. And we also expect this to be um, increased because of being able to serve more people outside um, and run their business more efficiently. Thank you, Councillor Collard and Rochelle. I have next, Councillor Vucic. Thank, thanks, Madam Chair. A uh, quick question I see with COVID and it tends to relate to the Alfresco as well. Um, obviously, with the uh, lockdown we've got, we can't do those uh, checks. But and you and you got this remote uh, on the remote check, which is I think a great idea. How um, is the other? Uh, is there any risk to diners with the uh, reduction? In, I suspect not, but that's one question I've got to ask. Um, Madam Chair, so uh, we have had a very vigorous um, verification process throughout our district and um, it's not something that these food businesses do need to have, um, you know, on a monthly or, or basis like that. If we did um, receive any complaints or any concerns in regards to um, food safety, um, then obviously we would treat that as, as more of an urgent response and, and uh, make sure that we do make contact with the um, business um, to, to see what has been going on. Um, if we had identified and, and we don't currently have any businesses that we've got major concerns in regards to health or that we've got under surveillance that would sort of be a story where we would be um, looking to um, ensure that you know compliance was being met but um, yeah we we do have a good verification history and have been completely up to date so we haven't got any that are sort of outstanding 
Thank you. Great answer. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Council of Research? No. I'm okay, not. Member Ward. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Rochelle, my question was just around the the um, business that refused, or the operator that confused, refused to comply. Um, just from a food safety perspective, um, I didn't see, is there information here? Was it a mobile um, hawker's licence, shopkeeper's licence? Was it a, um, a premises, cafe, restaurant? In what area, like, is that information available? Um, so this was a operator who was selling food on the um, side of the road without a, a licence, uh, who claimed uh, that it was for um, the purposes of um, fundraising. Um, however, under the Act, it allows you to have a certain number of fundraising activities uh, without having to have a licence, and this person was um, doing this very regularly, and we had doubts on where the actual funds were, were going. Um, so they were, you know, advised uh, around the process, um, given many verbal warnings, and um, it, they didn't stop doing what they um, they kept every week. Really, um, we were on the side of the road selling food, so there was a concern that this was regular and that it could potentially there was it was building up uh, to be more than just uh, the likes of a sausage sizzle. There were more at risk foods that were being. Um, sold as well. So we certainly had to just, um, you know, we, we tried absolutely everything and infringement was our last, you know, we followed the VAID model, uh, but um, infringing was at our last resort. So we are continuing to monitor the situation. Yeah, thanks, Rochelle. Awesome question, Member Ward. And now we have you, Member of Councillor Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rochelle, for the report. Um, I just wanted to make a comment first on page 37. Uh, it talks about the debt management team working with a business who are struggling with the impact of COVID and really just wanted to applaud that approach that's being taken. Um, it's really important that we support our hospitality businesses in any way that we can. And just picking up on uh, Councillor Collard's point around increasing awareness around alfresco dining and taking on board your response, which um, was a great response. I noticed that uh, the team are aiming to get out a food business newsletter on a quarterly basis uh, in terms of educating around business requirements. And I was just wondering if they're we're going to be opportunities taken up to educate our business owners about what they can be doing to um, make improvements, especially in the alfresco dining space and things as well. Any comments on that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, so Madam Chair, um, our, our team leader of environmental health is very proactive in educating um, food business um, owners and the community newsletter is something that we were hoping to take photos this week outside of Monganui Fish and Chip Shop who are going to be our, our first um, poster uh, for that one and it was going to be sort of a seasonal one where um, just reminders on, on what can be done. So we'll be using that as a, an opportunity to do as much as we can to uh, one educate around, you know, food, uh, you know, selling good and healthy food, but also around uh, ways that, you know, different the alfresco and, and giving um, ideas on what can be done. So it's it's a new thing, um, and but we would certainly see that as a, a mechanism to be able to do um, a lot of educating, giving ideas and things like that to assist businesses. Uh, every time there there is a COVID level, we do have... Um, all the businesses have got a spreadsheet. Um, and so as soon as the levels are changing, information sent out to remind business owners. And, and also this team does the alcohol um, to uh, get them on board with what they can and can't do. So um, yeah, we're doing quite a bit of work in that space. Awesome, Rochelle. And you got a round of applause there by um, ICON. I think that completes the discussion on this paper. I will put the paper to the vote. Thank you, Malima. Dave Collard in favour. John Carter? 
Deputy Mayor? Aye. Councillor Smith? Aye. Research? Aye. Member Ward? Yes, it's four. Aye for um, me. Oh, thank you. All right, now moving right along to the District Services Monthly Business. No, District Services Monthly Business Report for August 2021 that we received this report. A mover, please. Happy to move. Oh, yeah, I, I got, I saw it on screen, Councillor Collard and Court. Sorry, Rachel. And um, Rochelle, did you have anything you wanted to say about this report? Madam Chair, Dr. Dan. May, uh, may, yes. uh, the, this is a report for the group as a whole, so it, it yep. covers three departments, one of which is Rochelle's, um, looking after the, um, the resource consents and, and other parts of, of um, her portfolio. So I'm um, happy to take any questions. The, the, the report, as you can see, is full of statistics and information relevant to all three departments. Uh, if there are questions specific to, um, to Rochelle's area, then um, um, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer those. And I will cover off any other questions relating to building and the um, community and customer services. Awesome. Thank you for that. I don't see any hands flying. Oh, there we go. We've got Deputy Mayor and Court. Take it away. Oh, and then I've got Member Ward. I don't have a question, but I want to do a big shout out. Yesterday, and I wasn't sure where to raise it in the agenda, yesterday I sat down and I watched the event organisers workshop. It's two hours, two and a half hours long, so it's not a short watch, but it was so good that I had to send an email to Rochelle, an email to Dr. Dean, an email to Sean uh, to tell them all how amazed I was by that, that workshop. Anybody who wants to do anything in the district just needs to sit down and watch that start to finish. And all your questions are answered. They walked you through how to navigate the website. They walked you through how to fill in a form. Uh, Catherine Tremaine walked you through all the funding that's available out there in the district, the requirements for food, the requirements for an alcohol licence. It was remarkable. I can't say how proud I felt sitting here at home uh, watching our team do their business uh, online. And um, I just think it's really important to, to shout out outstanding work when you see it. So... Um, I just want to acknowledge that. That's all I've got to say. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and Court. I haven't had the opportunity to see it myself, and I do have the link in my inbox, but I did wonder whether it was going to be made publicly available um, on YouTube. I certainly have read it and I'm um, and, and, um, participating in quite a bit of that activity myself. Uh, in terms of the snap of Bonanza. So, uh, yes, I think it's awesome as well. Um, Rochelle, is it going to be on the YouTube channel or on the, is it through the website? Um, Madam Chair, sorry, we haven't got to that stage yet. We've sent it out to all of the um, 260 people that were invited to uh, the event. Um, but I think it would be good to perhaps put on at least our website and I can certainly um, explore putting it through on, on YouTube. Um, great idea. Yeah, that would be good because not, you know, so, some of the potential organisers we wouldn't have contact for. Member Ward, but um, Dr Dean, did you want to add something in? Just to um, thank the committee members for their congratulations. I, I think congratulations are due to Rochelle and in particular to Chrissy Rosenthal, who heads up the um, Environmental Health Services team. Um, so this is something that forms part of our up and out um, focus 
focusing on enhanced customer service. And I think it's a great example of something we can put out there and that is, is reusable because in its form, in the way it was recorded. Um, and thank you, Councillor Court, for, for, um, for raising this because um, I think it is something that we can be proud of and uh, you know put out there um, as a service to on balance 260 people 262 i think was the exact number of people invited only 30 attended unfortunately so we we do need to follow up and we have in terms of e emailing that out to everyone but we certainly should leverage this and we we will uh, in terms of making it known to those who couldn't attend great thank you dean member ward Thanks, Madam Chair. And just following on from that, I'm glad to hear and thank you that it's great because it clashed with our community board meeting and I was a bit gutted about that, um, bearing in mind the number of applications we have for funding. So I know I have a, a task on my hands to get all my board members to watch that video. Um, I have a few questions in the report. Um, firstly, just around eyesight, um, I think the COVID disruption um, has been a real challenge for our eyesight and perhaps as an opportunity for us to look at uh, what can be done to determine the value of the brand. Uh, this is going to be something moving forward that, that Council's already touched on and uh, something that, that's dear to my heart and um, particularly important, I think, right across the district, not just in the Bay of Ireland. So um, I would like to think we could perhaps look at, at um, the, the value of, um, or the function and the value of that, the loss of that service over that time and what that, what information centres and service centres actually mean to our customers and clients, um, irrespective of what they offer, how, how the information brand is perceived. Uh, the second part of that is um, with regard the annual franchise fee for that brand, um, have we seen any relief there? I, I know I've asked the question of Far North Holdings that we haven't received any relief uh, for rental on the premises uh, that they own with our information centres in them. And I just wonder with regard to the VIN side of it, whether or not we have actually seen any um, any relief over the last couple of years with all the lockdowns that we've had. And um, I don't actually know what we pay for that brand. Um, so that's, that's another of my questions. Um, do you want to deal with that first? I'm, Thanks, Dr. Dean. Madam Chair, through you, um, that is an important issue for us, um, the focus on, on uh, lost revenue. Of course, we are now uh, in a position where it's all local uh, tourism as opposed to international. And with Auckland locked down the way it is, we're not seeing Aucklanders coming north. Uh, and so it is impacting on the bottom line. As part of the Section 17A review that we will be undertaking uh, to focus on eyesights going forward and the future of, of our eyesight in context of the National VIN Inc. Um, Visitor Information Network and Tourism New Zealand in terms of the, um, the proposal, and that's all it is, a proposal to have a tier one, tier two system which we can opt in or opt out of. We're using our section um, 17A review to review all of that and also to look at our revenue quite critically. Bearing in mind that our service, our, our eyesights do double as service centres as well, where people can pay their rates and come and do transactional. Um, um, Today, John Carter. Thanks. How are you? Uh, Good, thank to, you, love. Good. To do transactional items. Uh, so, the long answer, short answer to, to what you're asking is yes, it will be addressed. It is of concern that our tourism numbers are down and therefore revenue is impacted as well. So it's certainly part of our overall consideration of the way forward. Yeah, thanks for that, Dr. Dean. I, I think probably my question was a little bit lost in translation there in the sense that it, it, it's, the, it's what we pay for the franchise of the eye and the value of that versus how the actual resident rate payer sees the value of the information centre, not from a VIN perspective, not from the visit information network side of it, but from on the ground in the community grassroots side of it is where I'm coming from. But thank you for that. My second question, how many plots do we have available at present in our cemeteries for burial? Do we know? 
Madam Chair, I would have no idea. I'd need to take that away and I could answer that offline. Uh, number of plots in cemeteries, no idea. Um, there has I been some. Have got, I have got a report on that recently because I've been working to get um, better information from IAMS on when they're addressing the um, shortages, which have been highlighted as Russell and Kaikwe. Yes, so I can send that through to Belinda. Thanks. Thanks, Madam Chair. That would be great. Yeah, if I may, in addition, um, there is consideration. Consideration has been given to what a pandemic may do and looking at capacity of our cemeteries. So that's some other work that has happened behind the scenes. Uh, of course, um, there's a whole range there of burials, tr traditional burials, as, as well as um, cremations, et cetera, et cetera. But that's uh, not a great topic, but um, a real part of the reality of what we may face uh, if, there were, um, if there were an outbreak in the far north. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that spurred that question, um, Dr. D, was actually um, some land was gifted at Long Beach uh, recently, well, some time ago, for um, additional um, plots. And uh, people have actually been turned down wanting to use those sites. And I was unaware of just how lengthy uh, that process is to actually um, formalise that, that land and those sites. So, um, yeah, it was way more involved than I had ever dreamt of. <laughs> now, my final question, um, just with regard to staffing, I see we've um, completed recu recruiting a fixed-term monitoring officer. How many do we have? Do we just have one? On page well, 91. Madam Chair, I'll allow Rochelle to answer that. I think I know the answer. It's around six. Uh, uh, for for RC monitoring officers, we have um, two. They're in a... a bigger team of the Bailaran uh, monitoring officers as well. So we have one uh, full-time resource consent monitoring officer and we have got one other on a fixed term contract um, with the amount of uh, resource consents that are being issued. Um, there is a high number obviously that need to be monitored. So we are um, certainly needing resourcing in that area. Um, so for district plan breaches and RMA breaches that come through on a uh, an RFS-based um, reactive, uh, there is a team of a further uh, five officers who do um, work towards those ones. So um, I think the US resource consent monitoring officer uh, does work in looking at the conditions of a resource consent that's already been issued. Um, so it's more proactive um, rather than the reactive, which is the wider group. Um, I was just asking that partly um, the, the recent monitoring of the Alfresco dining licence, was was that brought about through the internal audit or was that actually um, standard? How often do we actually monitor our um, existing bylaws? Is, is there a, an annual or is it random? Madam Chair, so the uh, monitoring of the Alfresco licences have has previously sat with the monitoring team um, and has recently been transferred to the environmental health team because of the food component in that area and the requirement to sort of have those. Um, so it has um, perhaps not been monitored as well as what it should be um, going forward. Um, and so these are all done on a, um, I, I, it's not on a, the annual basis for the applications that come in, but there has been a number of uh, dining places where they haven't got a licence. So those are the ones that we need to capture now and then on an ongoing basis. That is a, an annual application um, and it would be, uh, we would have more of a, a base of who has got one and who hasn't. Um, and moving forward. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you, Member Ward and Rochelle. I've got Councillor Smith next. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of points. The first one, I'd just like to take the opportunity. This is a great report. I really, really appreciate it. I do struggle, though, because I think all of the text, and I'm not sure if it's just the digital version, 
all of the text is screenshotted into the agenda. So it's quite small, it's a little bit blurry. As you can see, my eyesight's not amazing, but I, I do struggle with this report. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to raise that. Um, but the, the content is excellent. So it's worth the struggle. Um, first thing I wanted to do a shout out to the library team. It's incredible to see the uptake in the digital space, especially with the eBooks, uh, et cetera, and the borrowings there, but also with the digital checkouts. Um, so really, really cool to see that improvement and the jumping into the 21st century library uh, concept there and just really wanted to applaud that. Um, my question is around housing for the elderly and the increased debt levels. They're sitting quite high and I was just wondering if there was any additional commentary as to why that might be and what's being done to address that. It was um, the, the increase was quite significant. So if anybody has anything to add to that, that would be great. Thank you. All yours. Madam Chair, um, the follow up is being done. We are keeping a close eye on that. We're working closely with our colleagues um, in infrastructure asset management who met physically manage the facilities. We administer, administer um, the facilities. So it does fall to us to focus on the financial side, the income, et cetera, et cetera. So we are following up on that. I don't have any uh, immediate answers, but um, yes, it is, it is uh, something that we uh, are focusing on. Thanks, Dr. Dean. Just um, a supplementary. There hasn't been anything that would trigger those increased levels. Um, there's no reason that might have caused that. I, through you, Madam Chair, I can't answer that right now. I, I do know that um, people have experienced some difficulty uh, for a variety of reasons, um, and whether it's uh, a matter of income levels affected for, by, a, you know, again, a variety of reasons, I can't answer that right now. But we'll come back with some uh, clarification on that. Member Ward. Sorry, Madam Chair, to come back, but I did actually um, also have noted on page 99 the huge increase in um, alcohol licence issued and just a little bit of clarification around that, please, in August um, of this year. Sorry, Michelle, I'm just I'll trying to find the page. You, Madam Chair, I'll defer to you to um, Michelle for that one. Um, page 99, 99. the graph. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm unsure why the uh, the large number of alcohol licences were issued at that time. I can find out. I would assume that it was the time for them to be due, but it does seem to be quite large. So I don't have that information at this stage, but I will be able to um, get that back to you. Uh, I think that our um, chair of the DLC may be able to add some insight there. Any court? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just, I hadn't picked up on that. So I'm just going through my liquor licensing box and September was an all-time low. So in September, I issued a total of 47 licenses, which is really low. So I think that's an anomaly. I just think we need to check that. They're really down because of COVID. There's no special licenses happening. There's no um, festivals, uh, and I'm not getting new licenses. At all. And perhaps, perhaps I think in your right. August, August might be, you know, the September number might be in August. Some of them may have put them in a bit earlier. We've had a lot of um, delayed applications as well. It's just not showing up here at this end. So I keep a record of every single liquor license I issue here. And generally, we're running around the 40 to 60 per month. There are no outliers there. Yeah, this report doesn't have September. It only goes to August, so. I've got them all here. Sorry, I've got them all here and I can go back. Yeah. 
um, October, September, August, um, none of them are showing up as exceptional. Maybe um, Rochelle, double check. Check. Thank yep, you for that. Thing, you. All right. No more questions on this report or comments. Let's have the vote. Um, I'm I. I for Gabe Collard. I for me. Oh, thank you. I for me. I. Hi. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Now we have our action sheet and the recommendation that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report action sheet update October 2021. And does I have a mover and a seconder, please? Deputy Mark, I'll move. So that was um, Carter and Smith, I think. Yep. Any comments on this action sheet, members? Zilch. Okay. I. Collard. I. Uh, yep. Sorry. Hi for me. Hi for me. Hi. Hi. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and before I close the meeting, uh, Dean or Sean, we worship. Did you have any comments you wished to make? I've got nothing to add. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Just that I thought the level of questioning was a model of good governance today. Sometimes we get down into operational detail that I, 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 I try to be quiet about and get annoyed by. Uh, but today was really good um, governance cross-examination. Rochelle, you, you were under the bus numerous times today. Well done on, on scrambling. Dean's got Dean and Rochelle both have got got some takeaways that I'm sure they'll come back with 100% of the answers on. But thanks very much for um, showing interest in the portfolio to the elected members. Thank you, Sean. I have nothing to add, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, I um, think that we gave Dean and Rochelle a very heavy workout today. You go have a cup of tea after this. <laughs> um, I'll do our closing karakia. Kia to, kia tato kato, te atafaya to tato ariki. O ihu karaiti, me te aroha, me te atua, me te fifinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, ake, ake. Amene. Amene. Thanks, Madam Chair. Ka kite anō. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.